You know what I want to do now, Johnny D, is maybe go through the decades uh, without spending too much time, maybe just time capsules of each one. The 50s here in Phoenix, if you could explain what the Phoenix sound is, the twang was the shot heard around the world or the traje tra trajectory or something from the audio recorder's studio. Can you tell us about that? Well, um, yeah, the 50s here, um, you know, a as well as uh, across the country, you know, Elvis kind of changed everything in the early 50s. I mean, um, the Beatles, you know, in the 60s, I mean, there are groups that suddenly – uh, change things and then everyone emulates them and start but but in in the case uh here in phoenix in the 50s as most you know towns it was pretty much you know country and uh um uh in the clubs and as well as uh the big radio stations were country this is before you know rock and roll really gets going and uh so those were kind of the roots and in the studios that was kind of reflective of that but we were very lucky because there was a studio here originally called Ramsey's Recorders that Clay uh, Ramsey, the father, and Floyd, the son, started. And it was like so many places. It was a radio and television repair shop that kind of had a little branch off. And they were, they got a lathe and started cutting uh, square dance records in Phoenix. And Clay, uh, besides uh, repairing uh televisions built this little building on the corner of 7th street and weldon and there was a barber shop in there there was a very small studio there was a um a record store called record land that they put in there and then at the end was the uh, television and radio repair shop and they they were the hoffman television distributors so so they started this little recording studio and uh, lee hazelwood comes into the picture then in like 1956 55 56 you talked about ray odom earlier well ray was the man ray odom uh, had a saturday night show called the arizona hayride at madison square garden on 7th avenue in phoenix so that's where the cream of the musicians and singers musically would uh, perform i mean that was kind of their entree into the public at these shows that ray odom produced and uh, uh among the band was uh, the arizona hay riders that uh, al casey was a member of and young lee hazelwood was a dj down in coolidge and he would bring Dwayne eddie and jimmy dell jimmy delbridge up they were his kind of uh two uh, young singers that he was kind of managing. And they, uh, Dwayne actually sang, if you can believe it, in those days, kind of in the style of the Leuven brothers. And uh, so the he would bring them up here, and that's where Lee uh, saw, you know, the bigger scene, Ray Odom, a bigger venue, all these great musicians. And so uh, by the time he moved up here in uh, uh, 1955, Ray got, or excuse me, Lee Hazelwood got a job at Crux. So uh, Dwayne stayed down there going to high school and Lee came up here and he was a budding songwriter. I mean, any, if anything, you know, you can point to one thing. Hazelwood was the linchpin for so many things happening here in Phoenix. And it kind of culminated in 1956. Uh, he, he had a record, his own record label called Viv, and he put out some recordings by Jimmy Spellman and Jimmy Johnson. And they were members of the Sunset Riders. So basically... He, he saw this band that was employed by Ray Odom and said, hey, I've got some songs that I'd like you to perform of my songs because that was what he wanted to be, was a songwriter. And so he put out a couple of releases uh, in Phoenix on his Viv record label. Uh, he was His daytime job was a DJ. He was working out on the Mesa Tempe Highway at KTYL for Red Harkins, Ron and Dan Harkins' dad. And Red had a radio TV and a movie theater out there uh, between Mesa and Tempe. In any case, KTYL hired uh, uh, Hazelwood. So that was kind of his daytime job. And then he was writing songs and doing some recording at Ramsey's. He'd run out of money, but he had this new song he'd written called The Fool. And he, uh, he knew that um, it was a good song. He didn't have any more money to invest in his own label. So... Uh, there was a small record label working out of Ramsey studio. It was basically a desk in the front office called MCI music counselors incorporated. And they, uh, for the most part did commercials. So if you were a local 
business and you wanted some kind of music commercial for your radio ads, they, they could write it and record it for you. And they also did, and it's kind of funny to think of now, uh, your poems set to music. So if your lovely wife had written some poems, you could take them down there to MCI and Connie Conway and Jimmy Wilcox would write a little lead sheet and they would set some music to your poems and then they cut you a lacquer. They cut you a little acetate of this music. So you could, uh, you know, give it as a gift to your wife or, you know, whomever, but th they made money on that. Your like people do now songs, you know, your song set to music. So people have done that over the years. It, and I'm sorry to cut you off here, Johnny, but uh, we have just a few minutes left on the YouTube, and I would like to, you mentioned Sanford Clark and the Fool. Could we talk about uh, Dwayne Eddy's Rebel Rouser? Well, we can, but the Fool got us there, because that was the first hit in 1956 that got Hazelwood the credibility and the notoriety. And by then, uh, Dwayne had graduated, so they were working on these kind of instrumentals that came to fruition in 19. 58 with uh, with rebel rouser and uh hazelwood had been going over to la and realized he needs some kind of an echoey sound that there wasn't enough echo at ramsey studio and that changed the name to audio recorders same location so uh they came up with this uh empty 2500 uh, gallon water tank empty with a speaker and one end and a microphone over the opening that they could send the sound into and it would bounce around in there and then they put it back on the tape. So uh, between uh, Hazelwood and Dwayne Eddy and Jack Miller, they created this wonderful twangy sound that Rebel Rouser sent around the world in 1958. It was a gold record all over the world, created right there on the corner of 7th Street and Weldon and audio recorders. <laughs> Thank you. 